once in a while. Welcome to another edition of uh, Down the Road with me, Joel Heitkamp. We're going to get a chance to visit with Dave Kolpak today. We're going to get a chance to visit with uh, an attorney out of Dallas today. We're going to get a chance to visit with a lot of folks today. Uh, but before all of that, uh, he's a friend of mine, full disclosure, and he's somebody I respect immensely. I served with him all 14 years that I was in the North Dakota Senate. He's still there, and that's good news for the state of North Dakota because we need him to still be there. The legislative session is over. They've gone signy die, and so we asked him to visit with us again down the road, and he was good enough to come right into the studio. So let me bring in Senator Tim Mather. And Senator, good to have you coming down the road with us. Thank you very much for having me. How did it feel to get packed up and uh, to head on home? Well, it's always a little nostalgic, you know, and I, uh, I really get invested in the legislative session, spend a lot of time there, and uh, work hard, try to make a difference. Uh, so there's kind of a, a, a uh, adrenaline hype that goes with the legislative session, and especially the last couple of weeks. I'm on a number of conference committees where we make a deal. And so when it's over, there's just a little bit of a down that has to be worked with. And uh, so it's, uh, it's good to be involved in legislation, politics. It's important stuff. It's tough when you don't get all done that what you want to get done. So the people of District 11 and the people of Fargo have said you're our guy. They've sent you out there for how many years? How many sessions now? 36 years. Okay, that's a long time. Yeah. That's a long time, and, and there's a reason that they wanted that, and quite frankly, I know it, because you're good at it. Uh, and your heart and your soul is in the right place. But let me ask the question this way. When you look back on this session, uh, compared to all of those other sessions that you were willing to serve, what do you think about this one? Well, I, I think it's actually a status quo session. Um, there really wasn't anything dramatically unique. So it's a little bit sad to think of all of the money that was available to us. And there was a lot of things that were done that are basically supporting the status quo. Take one example. We started the, the, um, the energy uh, authority and we left all of the regular players on the board of directors, coal, oil, gas. We didn't put batteries on or wind or solar. So when you start a big brand new authority on energy, it seems like the day has come when you'd spread that out a little bit, but we didn't. So that's the sad thing. Um, I think, you know, we missed potential things like family leave. Um, I, I think this was an opportunity with the resources we had to actually change things for people. You know, I hearken back to 1919, of course, I wasn't there. <laughs> but, you know, I've read a little bit about it. When they came into session in 1919, they changed the child welfare, child welfare working laws. They created workers' compensation. They created the Bank of North Dakota. They created the state mill and elevator. Now, that was exciting change. And we had the resources to do the same thing this year, but really didn't quite do it. So uh, that's a little bit what I'm thinking about and uh, thinking, well, let's give her a run out again. We're going to redistrict. They're going to redraw the lines, and there are so many Republicans, <laughs> they're going to have to figure out which Republican runs against which Republican. Yeah. And uh, so the lines will be redrawn. We'll have another election. We'll have another shot at it. So you, you talk about the boldness um, of a legislative session to, to do something because you have the revenue to do it. Uh, when we were serving together, those were tough financial times uh, for the state of North Dakota. Uh, we were getting legislative sessions done in 65, 67 type days. Uh, the Dorsos of the world, they ran a pretty tight ship. Um, you know, Ed Schaefer's budget reflected the fact that there wasn't a lot of money in it. 
like you said, now, you know, you got the legacy fund, you've got all of these things that you could draw interest off, just interest off and, and do some big, bold projects. So I got to ask you, what should have they done? Well, one of the things we should have done was pass a $2 billion bonding bill uh, that actually just used our present infrastructure decision-making process to upgrade all of our schools, upgrade uh, the, the amount of money that we have in deferred maintenance. We have hundreds of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance. That's basically roofs and insulation and all that that's not being done. That could have all been done. Um, we could have got the, uh, uh, all of the counties and township roads in excellent condition. Um, so anyway, that's the process. Now, there is something positive about it. Bonding, we did pass a portion of the bonding bill. And bonding evens out not only our spending, but our workforce. You know, for many years, we were cash. If we, want, if we had cash, we would pass a bill to do some roads or build some buildings. And then if the workers were there, great, but sometimes they weren't there. So we actually paid uh, the cost plus to, to get the work done. When you have bonding, you sort of even that out over 25 years. So you know, every year we're going to spend so many dollars on roads, so many dollars on buildings, and that keeps our workforce here. So we did pass a bonding bill. It's not near what it should have been. It's got a lot of little deals in it, little private deals that aren't quite the best, but the principle is correct, so that's positive. So before we talk about, you know, initiatives like what is going to change, uh, you know, for example, you're in Fargo. One of the big players in Fargo is North Dakota State University. Uh, that being said, what's the model for higher ed going to be down the road? I want to get to that. Uh, but you, you said, uh, you know, th that when you look at this, this session, you don't see anything bold. You know, I would make an argument that part of what I see this session is that far right wing of the Republican Party playing out to the public instead of that nuts and bolts and hard work people like you were doing an appropriations committee where you're focused on, I mean, I had Yana Myrdal on my show talking about the Ten Commandments bill. I asked her what the Ten Commandments were, not as though I didn't know what they were. I said, no, recite them. She couldn't do it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. She couldn't do it. So, I mean, you had all this philosophical, you know, this is what it's got to be. This is where the right stands. And in the end, a large part of that defined this legislative session. Yeah, you know, there are these social issues, really uh, contrived issues. These are issues that are, you know, brought up and developed in right-wing think tanks around the country, and then they're dished up to right-wing legislators in North Dakota mm -hmm. to put into the legislative session. So we, you know, we, we, we dealt with issues that um, really are outside of our control, even things like transgender and, and things like that. We spent an inordinate amount of time um, on even issues, even like the First Amendment issues, so like exotic pieces of that. My, my gosh, North Dakota is, is very Second Amendment oriented. It's very open to guns and hunting and all that. But we had like eight more bills I don't know, now we're down to what's the size of the scope on the end of a certain rifle, and could we put two of them there? You know, it's just... <laughs> and a grenade launcher right <laughs> next to it. <laughs> it's just wasting time on stuff like that, and that keeps us away from the bigger issues of growing our economy, or even like um, the issues of the border, immigration and refugees. Uh, there was all of this hype about stopping these people and making sure they don't come to North Dakota. <laughs> Every Chamber of Commerce president that I talk to says, we need people. <laughs> we need workers. <laughs> we need workers. Oh. And uh, I said to one of the senators, uh, Senator Hogue one day, I said, you know, Fargo is here 
And Minot is here. And Minot's always going to be a little town unless it becomes open to new Americans. You know, you go down the, our factory areas around Fargo, who's working there? It's new Americans. Gwinner, building bobcats. You go to our hospitals. You go to our nursing homes. Who's working there on the front line? It's new Americans. And if you don't accept new Americans, you're going to be a little town, and you're going to dry up and blow away. So that's really the tough issue. It's not just this this uh, psycho babble about we're against these people. We have to figure out how do we make this work so that our economy can grow, so that we can properly introduce new Americans, so that you and I can feel comfortable with new Americans in our community. And how do we make sure they get on the boards and the commissions and they're a part of our future versus, oh my God, Somebody might be crossing the border at Mexico, <laughs> and that's just fruitless. I mean, in fact, Bergam puts out this thing about we're going to make sure some executor makes sure no one shows up here. You know, I, I, I sent him a note saying, you know, what you ought to do is send the National Guard down there with the truck and pick up some <laughs> that want to work here in North Dakota. And let's figure that out. So that, that's an example. Did you get a response to that? Well, you know, there were some chuckles. Okay. And, um, but I think if you talk with the Department of Commerce, their new director, he knows it. He's spoken to me about it. And you talk to the president of any decent-sized chamber of commerce, they know it. And they want to do things to move that but there's these, these people that stir up a kind of an anti-brown person mentality. Yeah. Senator Mathern, stick around. I've got more questions for you. I, I told them we were going to talk about NDSU and the model for higher education. Let's do a little bit of that when we come back right here down the road. Howdy, folks. It's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you're due for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill at our salad bar. Sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a combo that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan. And yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. Hi, Hunter Ellis here for Night Hero Binoculars by Atomic Beam. These binoculars let you see anything, even in pitch black darkness. Gotcha. The secrets are powerful wide angle atomic beam laser that reveals objects up to 150 yards away hidden by darkness. During the day, Night Hero gives you 10 times magnification. And when the sun goes down, press the night bright button to see clearly in the dark. Light up garbage eating critters or spot thieves before they even get close. Call or click now and get Night Hero binoculars for just $39.99. Order right now and you can double it. Plus, get our best-selling atomic beam flashlight. Just pay a separate fee. We'll even ship them to you free. This TV special offer is not available on Amazon. You can get it all, but you have to order now. Call 1-800-619-1091. That's 1-800-619-1091. Or visit bynighthero.com. That's bynighthero.com. Order now. <laughs> Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury? After taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked Elmiron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome to maculopathy, which is sight threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. Call Elmiron Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680.
Non-attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1-800-230-9210. Well, the legislative session has gone sine die. We're having a chance to visit with uh, State Senator Tim Mathern. And the one thing I wanted to talk to you about, Senator Mathern, is the model for higher education in, in this post, well, during, I should say, COVID world, where we have less people on campus, we have more people learning online. Is higher ed ever going to look the same? I think higher ed has changed. It will continue to change just like our legislative session. Now we got citizens that could look in on our committee work and see what's going on. That's a change that's gonna be permanent. Mm -hmm. I think our higher education institutions are gonna change. We're in online processes are just gonna be integral to education. Um, so, So that's a change, however, you can't get everything out of Google. You can't get everything out of online. Another thing that's important about higher education is developing relationships. And some of that stuff happens just by being with one another, uh, studying with one another, partying with one another. There's a lot of stuff that happens on higher education campuses that are long-term consequential, and that's relationships. So while I support the changes that are going on in terms of technology, I am also concerned that we don't dump the relationship aspect. And another change is going on where we're focused so much on workforce. We got to be careful. There's more that happens at a university than training somebody for a job. It's also training somebody to think training somebody to get along with other people, training somebody to work in teams. So that has to stay at our universities. So I am supportive of the changes, but we have to be careful that we don't throw away some other really good things about a university education. So in in terms of COVID and and what changed around North Dakota because of COVID, what, what incentives can we utilize to get people over that hump? I'm assuming you've been vaccinated. Right. And I've been vaccinated. And both of us would encourage anyone and everyone to be vaccinated. But how do we get over that next hump? If you look at some of the numbers, and it isn't just Western North Dakota. You know, there's numbers all over this state that, that won't get vaccinated. They've chosen themselves not to. West Virginia given a $100 bond to all young people who get vaccinated. Um, I mean, how do we get to that, that next point where we get people to take the shot? Well, part of it is you and I. For example, today I posted on Facebook, I'm going to be on your show. But as part of that, I also said we need to get our coworkers, friends, relatives, and neighbors to get vaccinated. That means you and I got to talk to our contacts and encourage them to get vaccinated. But we also need to do more things in terms of public health to actually move public health activity outside of our our vaccination sites. Uh, You know, the Biden administration is talking about getting in the vans, getting into uh, buses, getting out there. Well, North Dakota, it's the same. We have to get out there. We have to use our resources. And I'm hoping our new... uh, uh, director of Department of Public Health, state health officer. He's coming from Nebraska. I haven't met him yet. I don't know much about him, but um, Bergham tried to run our public health department during this past year. Now he's actually got some help, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe they can do some you know, pushing out in the hinterlands and out in the areas where they don't believe in the COVID vaccine. 
uh, or the COVID itself. We just got to get down to the street. We got to do it. It's a street project now, and it's not just a public relations. Here's some nice ads. Here's some nice rationale. That just takes care of the cream. Now we have to get out there, get in our communities, and set up those mobile clinics and just get people there. You know, when I was a kid, and probably when you were a kid, when we had polio, we basically set up the place in the school. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody lined up and got their polio shots. And I think that's another thing we need to do is be much more useful in terms of using our local institutions. You know, let's set up some clinics at the school. Let's set up some clinics at the church. Let's set up some clinics at the farmer's union. Let's set up some clinics at places that people gather. And that association, I think, helps us accept that this is a reality and that there's a community need to do it. Well, I can tell you this. I, I stop in Morton on the way home uh, that night because I'm going to meet a buddy. And so Morton's, it isn't, it's a little over halfway home from Fargo every night when I drive home. And there's a, a great new place there. This is going to shock you. But I stopped at the Antelope Creek, a nice little hometown pub, right? Yeah. And I'm going to meet a friend and have a beer. Town's full. Looks like there's a wedding dance there. It looks like there's a, you know, uh, an anniversary party there. And I thought, okay, my, my new little bar is going to be hanging from the rafters. Nobody in it. Nobody in it. Uh, and then I asked, well, what's with all the pickups? What's with all the cars? They had done just exactly what you said. They had opened up a clinic at the, at the Legion Hall there in Morton. And then two or three of the, the guys that did pop in after that were friends of mine from Hankinson. They had sure. driven over. These are not guys you would think would be vaccinated. Right. And I said to them, I go, why? And they said, well, because it's at night. I could, I could stop here, number one. Number two, I don't want to get this, Joel. Yeah. So it was, a, just like you said, it was available at a convenient time for them. Yeah. You know, maybe on your program, the work you do, you ought to spotlight some of these places. I think it'd be a great idea. Yeah. Where's Joel going now? No. And who's he spotlighting in one of these local areas? That that creates a buzz about it. It creates an acceptance about it. And, and it helps us spread the message. The bottom line is our economy is going to blossom and grow to the extent that we crush COVID. And, uh, and the best way of crushing COVID at this point is vaccination. And so uh, that's what we got to do. And I, I just hope this new um, state director for health is going to get behind that. I'm a little worried. We passed a bill, I don't know if you're aware of, combining the health department with the yeah. Department of Human Services. I thought it was a crazy move. <laughs> It's making government bigger. You know, Republicans mm -hmm. always tell me they make government smaller. But I'm seeing all these bills where they make government bigger and bigger and bigger and spend more and more money. Uh, but anyway, he's probably on the way from Nebraska wondering now, what job do I actually have here? <laughs> but anyway, hopefully they tell me it's got a great public health background. Hopefully he puts his energy into that and gets our people vaccinated. Now, in your time in the Senate, as those decisions were being made, I used to, to call the Senate the, the grown-up room. And, and, and granted, it was because I was in it, number one. But, <laughs> but you know, the, the Republicans and the Democrats worked pretty doggone well in the Senate. But let me give you an example. Um, you know, the Senate seems to have swung so far to the right that when all this this questionable, I'd say crap, but I don't want to say that over air, all this terrible legislation would from the House would find its way over, we'd kill it. Yeah. We'd kill it. You don't see that anymore, Tim. You just don't. You see some of it, but you are correct, Joel. It's not the way it used to be. It used to be um, some of the more exotic or not necessary things happen in the House and then we would just defeat it in the Senate and get to our business. That's less happening now. And I, I would just caution us to be careful that we assume that anymore or that it's the fault of just individual legislators. 
Um, I think it's easy for us to sort of bitch and moan about certain individual legislators, but I'm starting to say to our citizens now, now wait a minute here, these people didn't just show up in Bismarck and say, I'm taking this seat. These people were elected. And so there's been a change on the part of, part of our citizens. Citizens need to be aware of that, that at some point, um, you know, they're the driver. Mm -hmm. They can drive this whole thing right in the ditch. <laughs> some and, would argue that they have right. to some degree. And, and so you are right. There has been a change. But we need to look to our citizens to be careful about their voting. And they should be asking questions before the election about where they vote on this or that, not after or not when they're already in yeah. Bismarck. When they're already in Bismarck, they're already elected, and they think God put them there. <laughs> and so they think whatever their point of view is must be correct, and we know that isn't always the case. Senator Mathern, always good to talk to you. We'll do it some more, okay? Thanks for having me. Senator Tim Mathern, ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, we're going to head to Dave Kolpak. Dave is a breaking news supervisor with the Associated Press. So stick around. We'll keep going down the road. Hey, everybody, I'm Doug Billings, your host of The Right Side with Doug Billings on Beck News. We bring you high-profile guests, ladies and gentlemen, exclusive guests. Now, you're not going to see these guests in most of the mainstream media outlets. Another thing that I do here is give guests a platform to speak freely. You're not going to see me censor anybody. Please join us, won't you? Weeknights right here on Beck TV and online at Beck.News. Cheers. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream sheets. When you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Introducing the Cool Turtle, the ultra comfortable mask enhancer that creates a protective, cool, and breathable space between your mask and your face. Simply slide under any mask or gaiter and immediately feel the refreshing pocket of air surrounding your face. Cool Turtle's ergonomically designed soft, comfortable shell immediately reduces mask friction, allowing you to breathe and talk in a comfortable environment. I can actually breathe. With the Cool Turtle, no more sweating. It's like I don't even have a mask on. Call now and get not one, not two, but three cool turtles for just $10. Order now and we'll send you two more cool turtles free. No fees, absolutely free. Plus, you can get a 10-pack of four-ply face masks. Just pay a separate fee. This offer is not available on Amazon. Get the real cool turtle now. Call 1-800-270-1219. That's 1-800-270-1219. Or visit at coolturtle.com. Order now. We're the ladies of another view, bringing you a fresh view on local issues. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Oh my gosh. Isn't that, that the most condescending, funny. rude email you've ever um, received? Well, welcome to National the third term of a certain president. I really believe that. And different perspectives you won't get on the mainstream media. Watch us weekday afternoons at 4.30 Central Time on Beck News and at Beck.News. Indoor football is back in Bismarck. Bucks football season is right around the corner. Grab a friend or family member for a night of action-packed, hard-hitting entertainment. The Bucks open at the Bismarck Event Center May 8th as they take on the Massachusetts Pirates. Catch the sweetest seats in the house right on the sidelines with VIP service at a Bucks turf table. Available now for single-game purchases. Secure your tickets today by calling 701-595-0771. Bucks football, half the field and double the fun. Welcome back to Down the Road. When I think of this man's family, uh, not, not just him, uh, because he definitely falls into this category, but when I think of his family, I think of journalism. I, I think of writing with an eye towards telling both sides of the story, doing your homework, 
and making sure that that's represented. Now, I've told you many times into this camera that, that I'm a, a radio commentator, I'm a, a television commentator. That does not make me a journalist. In fact, I'm just the opposite. I'm somebody to get a, a, you know, a conversation going. And, and to make you think which one's true, which one's not. Well, when you read Dave Kolpak, you're reading the truth. And uh, that's one of the reasons I respect him so much. Dave Kolpak works with the Associated Press, and he's the breaking news supervisor. Dave, good to have you coming down the road with us. Joel, great to be on with you. Um, you know, my dad was a journalist and my mother was an English teacher, so I didn't have much choice. And, you know, I, I appreciate your kind words, but I have no other skills. So. <laughs> That's not true. You beat me at golf once. It, and that putt was like total luck. Can we admit that? That thing was, it was like you putted from Fairmont all the way to the casino. It was a long putt. Yeah, I couldn't see the hole, I'll tell you that much. So. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they had to fix the green from you throwing a party on it for taking my money. That's, that's a whole nother issue. Tell people what a breaking news supervisor does. Um, well, uh, AP has a regional system now. Um, I'm part of four states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, which um, in the last couple of years, there's been no shortage of breaking news there. <laughs> So my job basically is to, um, when we get something that's, um, you know, needs to be on the wire, um, I usually write three or four paragraphs right away, you know, what's happening. And then I'll either try to find a reporter to, you know, take it over in, in one of those four states, uh, or I'll, you know, finish the story myself. But uh, it, it's quite exciting, you know, and in Minnesota and Wisconsin, you know, you've had a lot of political things. Uh, same with South Dakota. Um, you've got a governor there who I think wants to be president. And in North Dakota, you know, things are cooking here with, uh, you know, the oil uh, dispute. And, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a great uh, region to be a journalist. Well, uh, let's get to that. Uh a judge gives uh, the U.S. a uh, second chance to offer uh, Dakota Access Pipeline options. Now, you've been covering the Dakota Access Pipeline for since day one, when all of this controversy started. Uh, that federal judge, uh, you know, tell people where we're at in this story. Give people a little background here. Okay. Um, the federal judge in the D.C. Circuit, um, a couple of years ago, um, confirmed that we, that they needed a more thorough environmental survey, and that uh, in the meantime he, you know, believes that it should probably be shut down. Now he hasn't ruled on that yet, but that's where he's at. Um, everything else has been decided. They've got to finish this um, in-depth survey. Um, they're op because of that he pulled the permit. So. Technically, they're operating without a federal permit to do this. And so now he's waiting to hear basically the Biden administration's thoughts. Um, and, and they had a hearing a couple weeks ago, and, and the administration kind of chose to sat it up, or sit it out at that time. Um, they said they might shut it down, depending on what they find with the survey. Um, but they were really noncommittal, and I think the judge was a little taken aback by that. And... Um, now he's given them another chance to a state their opinion, and b let him know you know if the if the review's on schedule. They say it'll be done in March, 2022. <laughs> Maybe if they're a little ahead of schedule, that might affect the judge's decision. I don't know. So what's happening right now? Is is Dakota Access Pipeline shut down? Are they constructing? I mean, where are we at when it comes to the Dakota Access Pipeline in terms of it being built? Yeah, they're, they're open. They're open and running for business. As a matter of fact, uh, North Dakota has approved um, uh, a permit that they can increase the amount of oil they have moving through there. Now, they're not doing that yet um, because of this. Um, Dakota Access has also asked the Supreme Court to step in on this, um, on the fact on whether they need this uh, thorough review and you know, whether they are operating legally or not. Um, I don't believe the Supreme Court is going to step in on this, on this issue unless the judge 
uh, ops to shut it down. If he says, we're, we're, you know, oil's not going through there, then I think there's a chance the Supreme Court might hear it. But even then, you know, the fastest they could, they'll get to it will be nine months to a year. So how did we ever get there? How did we ever get to all the controversy, all the construction, everything that happened without an environmental review or an adequate environmental review? How did, is this just one federal judge saying, look, this is my opinion or, or quite frankly, did they not do their homework? I mean, where are we at with this? Well, you know, we had different administrations and, and President Trump came in and, um, you know, uh, kind of said, let's get this thing done. Um, uh, they claim, uh, at least the Trump administration, that, that they did do their homework and that it's fine. And, and the pipeline claims it's uh, safe. And, um, you know, in, in some respects, they, you know, they, there is some evidence that pipelines are um, safer in terms of human life than uh, moving it on a on the railway. But, um yeah, so uh, then the new administration comes in and um, they say, wait a minute, um, you know, we're not sure about this. And the judge is kind of, um, uh, he, when, when he uh, approved the permit the first time, he said at that point he had some problems with it and it was something that would probably need, need to be addressed later and later is now. Well. I, I would add into that that I I thoroughly agree. Moving oil by pipeline for me personally, um, it, there's plenty of evidence that it's way safer. It's 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 way better than moving it by rail or by semi in whatever way. The the dome pipeline went right by Manador, North Dakota, where I grew up, and they say that they're not inspected. That's bull. I see the planes going over it all the time, uh, checking it out. So uh, when do we get a decision? You said 2020. I mean, so it's just going to operate. It's going to keep doing what it does until 2020? Uh, well, no. The, the, I, 2022 is when the environmental well, I meant 22. Be Dave, sorry yeah, about that. In, in March. Um, but the judge is poised to do something any day now, Joel. Um, okay. And... and that's kind of why he asked for the core to give him an update. And, um, you know, we'll see what they say about it. We'll see if the Biden administration does step in and say we're shutting it down. But um, uh, the judge's move could come at any time. OK, but, yeah, I meant 2022. It just seems right. like a long way out. Dave, always good to talk to you. We'll see you on the golf course yet this summer. OK, Joel, sounds good. Work on your putting, buddy. <laughs> Dave Kolpak, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when we come back, Quentin Brogdon's going to join us. He's a Dallas trial lawyer. We're going to talk to him about whether or not your employer uh, can make sure you are vaccinated before you come into work. We'll talk to him when we come back. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell. And as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. My Giza sheets also include full 21 inch wide pillowcases that will fit over any pillow and deep pocket sheets that will fit over any mattress. The first night you sleep on my sheets, you'll never want to sleep on anything else. Go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen right now to get your very own MyPillow Giza Dream Sheets. Giza Dream Sheets are available in a variety of colors. Use your promo code and for a limited time, when you buy one set of sheets, you'll get another set absolutely free. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Not attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. This drug remains approved by the FDA. If you or a loved one regularly took Zantac and were later diagnosed with cancer, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Potential cancers include bladder cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, stomach cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer. Do not stop taking a prescribed medication without first consulting with your doctor. Discontinuing a prescribed medication without your doctor's advice can result in injury or death. Call 1-800-230-9210. 
Seniors, are you aware that you could pay less for your car insurance? Seniors can save money on their car insurance. You might save a little, you might save a lot. Maybe hundreds of dollars a year. You might save 5% a year, maybe 10%, 15%, or even more. That's a lot of money. So call right now and find out just how much money you might be able to save. 1-800-699-0761. one 800 699 Hi, it's me, Anthony Sullivan. And yes, you've actually caught me at home relaxing because life's been pretty worry-free since I got coverage with American Residential Warranty. You won't believe what ARW covers. Heating and air conditioning, washers and dryers, kitchen appliances, plumbing, water heaters, electrical systems, flat screens and laptops, even pools and spas, and so much more. Call American Residential Warranty. They'll get you covered. 1-800-219-1467. Watch No Filter with me, Debbie Schlussel, for no-nonsense, unfiltered analysis of the news that matters to you. You'll see engaging guests. It began a 444-day nightmare. Entertaining analysis. And it has everything to do with something that happened in history. And honest movie reviews. Trust me, this is just atrocious. No Filter with Debbie, weeknights at 10 p.m. Central on Beck News and online at Beck.News. In a little while, uh, we hope to be joined by Quentin Brogdon. Uh, Quentin is a Dallas trial lawyer. The big question here is, can your employer tell you to get uh, the COVID-19 vaccine or lose your job? Can they force you to do that? Now, uh, recently, I, I visited with Ed and Nancy Schaefer. Now, those are two names that a lot of people in North Dakota know. Ed was a very popular governor, former uh, Secretary of Agriculture for the nation under the Bush administration. And uh, Ed was one of those individuals that everybody got a chance to, to get to know. And, uh, you know, Governor Schaefer was pushing hard for people to get vaccinated. I don't know if that's going to help or not. I know that it's great that he's trying. Uh, the big question, as we mentioned, is we want to ask Mr. Brogdon is whether or not uh, employers can tell you you have to get vaccinated. So let's welcome him in. Quentin Brogdon, good to have you coming down the road with us. Great to be back, Joe. How are you doing? You bet. Now, as a, as a, a trial lawyer, you know what it's like to represent that client and to stick up for that client. And so I'm going to begin with the obvious first question. If I was an employer and I wanted to look uh, to that employee and say, you must get vaccinated or you're not coming to work here, what's your answer to that? Could they, I as an employer do that? Well, the first analysis you do is you look at what state you're in. You need to make sure there's not a specific state law. But generally, we can talk about the federal regulations and laws, and most states fall into at least rough line with that. The federal law says you can require someone to be vaccinated as long as you accommodate their sincerely held religious beliefs under a law called Title VII and their disabilities that make them more prone to an adverse reaction under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you have a duty to reasonably accommodate those but other than that, you can require as an employer, an employee to be vaccinated as long as your state doesn't prohibit it. Okay. You, you say Title VII. Um, okay. Best example I can give you. I have some people where I work and I manage there uh, where I work on a daily basis that will not get vaccinated. They claim that it's because of medical reasons. Can I require them to bring basically a slip from their doctor saying, that's what I said, these guys shouldn't get vaccinated? Can you as an employer require proof that they have a medical reason? Yes. You need to be careful. You need to have open lines of communication with your employees. You can require proof that they've been vaccinated and you can give them avenues to let you know and to communicate with you that they have, for instance, sincerely held religious beliefs, or disabilities that make them more prone, but you need to be very careful in getting into screening questions yourself. Uh, one of the things that at least some lawyers have advised is for employers to use third-party services to do that, so it's not the employer asking the question directly. It's merely a process to see that through. But you're right, Joel, probably one in four, one in five, depending on the statistics you read, 
of people out there say that they will just flatly refuse to get the vaccine. And I think that's why many employers are hesitating before they require it. It's an easier analysis if the employee works in a high risk occupation, they work for a hospital, they work in a nursing home. But if it's a white collar employee who sits behind a desk all day long, it's a little more difficult analysis. So you might, if you're an employer, want to consider making it voluntary, trying to incentivize your employees to get it. And there are some rules about what you can and can't do in that regard, uh, but at least not mandating it unless you have to. And accommodations as an employer could include letting employees who can work from home, work remotely, for instance. So, Quentin, I've had COVID. I have no idea where I got it. I've had it, just like most people when it comes to COVID. Some people have a strong idea where they got it. They might even know where they got it. Uh, when it comes to that employer-employee situation, can that employee that refuses to get vaccinated, can they in any way, shape, or form hold the employer uh, responsible? And the reason I ask this is because where I work, we have a strict policy of you, when you're around anyone, must wear a mask. Uh, when you go uh, down the hallway, when you go into an office setting, when you're together, you know, I work in, in radio as my full-time job. And when you go in there, you've got to wipe everything down. All of those steps. At some point, we're going to quit that. Uh, we're going to quit that because the vast majority of the people in that workplace have been vaccinated. The vaccine has been made available to the others. They don't want it. And so what I'm asking, I guess, is this long way of asking this question, Quentin. But if if those individuals that refuse it won't come to work and they get it, can they blame the employer for it? So just generally, if you work for a company and you believe you've contracted the virus at work in many states, you're going to be covered automatically by workers' compensation insurance and there will be a whole statutory, meaning it's enacted by the legislature, it's a law, a whole scheme that controls what you can recover for and what you recover. And those schemes generally do not just allow you to walk down to the courthouse and sue your employee. Generally, you make a claim, you go through a system and a process. Depending on the state, some states have enacted special laws and special regulations about COVID to say it either is or is not covered by workers' comp. California, for instance, says if you get it at work, it's covered by workers' comp. But not all states are like that, so there could be ambiguity. Some states, a minority of states, including my home state of Texas, allow employers to be what's called non-subscribers, not to offer as workers' comp insurance. And in those states, the employees of those employers who opt out of the system, the workers' comp system, can sue their employers. But they still would have a proof problem. They would have to prove they contracted it at work, which won't be easy. Yeah. Yeah, that is the problem. I, I mean, I, I think that that's... I, I've had individuals in my life that say, I got it from so-and-so, and I've got it from so-and-so. And then you track backwards, uh, and they went to a bar. Or they went to a clubhouse or they went to all these different places, which they don't know where they got it. I mean, they, they right. it, it's my personal opinion that they, they don't know where they got it. What about private industry in, in this sense, Quentin? Um, I, I'm assuming you're a Rangers fan. Can I assume that? It's tough to be sometimes, but yes, you okay. can make the assumption. Okay, well, it's tough to be a Twins fan uh, sometimes. But here in the North Country, we're Twins fans. If the Minnesota Twins tell us that you know what, you're not going to get into this stadium because we now finally can get a full crowd until you can give us some proof of vaccination. Can the Twins do that? Well, again, it depends on the state, and it also probably depends on some of the agreements that these franchises have with the leagues. You know, Major League Baseball, there are contracts that the Twins and the Rangers have signed that govern what they can do and what they can't do at games. So you'd want to look at the state and you want to look at that contract. And I don't know the answer to see whether it prohibits it. But if it does not prohibit it and if the state does not prohibit it, probably private places such as airlines, uh, twins, games, managers, etc., can require proof of vaccination. I know some of your viewers are not going to want to hear that, but legally, unless there's a specific statewide impediment or uh, something in a contract that 
a football team or a baseball team signs and says you can't do that when you invite people to the games in our league, then probably that could be made a requirement. Okay. Well, okay. Let, let me let me take it another direction. Uh, in the state of Minnesota, Governor Walls shut her down. Uh, he, he shut it down. And then he went to a quarter, and I think he went to a half. Uh, but, but here's the question. Some of the bars said no. No, nope, we're going to stay open. We're going to do what we, we want to do. And now the enforcement has come along with that. In fact, one bar owner in Minnesota was arrested over the weekend uh, with the governor making that proclamation and then the bar owner saying, nope, I'm not going to do it. Would you take the case of that bar owner? You know, it would be a tough case. Some of the lawyers who take those kinds of cases and some of the bars, frankly, that, that choose to stay open are doing it to make new law or to send a message. So if you say take the case to make a recovery for the bar owner with a you know reasonable prospect of, quote, winning the case, not necessarily. But if you ask me, take the case to make a broader societal point about free speech or control of the government over individuals, those tend to be the motives that those kinds of cases uh, are, are governed by, at least in, in my view, reading about them in the news and talking to other lawyers. You know, you want to hire a lawyer, ladies and gentlemen, with common sense, and you just heard one. Quentin, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on with us again. Thanks, Joel. Stay safe in Minnesota. You too. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to get an opportunity to give you some closing thoughts right here as we go down the road. Do you worry about going to the dentist? After all, a visit to the dentist can easily cost $2,000 or more. Well, relax. The Carefree Dental Card is now available in your area. Call now and we'll send your actual card at no cost today. With the Carefree Dental Card, you go to the dentist whenever you need and you instantly pay a lot less. Activate your card and you can start using it immediately. From exams and cleanings to more expensive procedures like crowns, dentures, even braces, they're all included with the Carefree Dental Card. Say you go to the dentist today without any card and your bill is, well, ouch. Wait a minute, let's try that again. You go to the dentist today and show your Carefree Dental Card, you save $525. The Carefree Dental Card is just $15.95 a month, so call now and make going to the dentist carefree. Call 1-800-416-5739 to receive your Carefree Dental Card Information Kit. 1-800-416-5739. Call now. I can't say enough good things about these nano hearing aids. Real people talking about nano hearing aids. The hearing quality is great. Until now, hearing aids used to be too expensive for the average person. Until nano. Call now and you'll get your nano hearing aids for only $297. You'll save $100. When you buy one hearing aid, nano will give you a second hearing aid free. Call right now. 1-800-213-3815. Spas, etc. Yeah, yeah. You've come to know and trust us for over 18 years with the largest selection and showroom in Western North Dakota for our beautiful Sundance spas. Plus, you can pick out your next home experience with our selection of pool tables, shuffleboards, and fun accessories. Spas, etc. Your relaxation destination on Made in Bismarck. Who do you trust with your digital life? Not all cloud backup providers keep your data truly private. Beck Cloud Backup uses advanced multi-layer encryption to keep your family photos, videos, and sensitive business documents secure and only for your eyes. Your Beck Lightband Internet service already includes 50 gigs of free storage to keep your digital life safe and secure. Call us at 701-475-2361 to start using your Beck Cloud Backup today. Attention, have you or a loved one suffered from maculopathy, a serious retinal injury, after taking the prescription drug Elmiron for interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome? In 2018, a researcher at the Emory School of Medicine linked Elmiron, a prescription drug that treats interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, to maculopathy, which is sight-threatening and can cause an abrupt change of vision. Call Elmiron Justice for a free legal consultation. Please call 800-395-5680.
You know, in this world today, and, and basically a lot of what's happened over the last four years has been uh, designed by and, and um, really is a reaction to President Trump. It is. He wanted this country divided. He got this country divided. It started before that. Uh, it isn't all on him, but he certainly ratcheted the whole volume of it up. And so there's good people that are out there uh, that are Republican, and I'm a Democrat, and you can work together. As I mentioned earlier, Ed Schaefer and I worked together on he and his wife uh, coming out and speaking on behalf of vaccination. I can only imagine, imagine what would happen if President Trump did what Ed Schaefer did on behalf of the American people. If he took to the airways like this and was sincere and said, look, for the good of America. Now, some of you are going to say he endorsed being vaccinated. If that's an endorsement to be vaccinated, that's about as weak as you can possibly get. It really is. And here's the thing about uh, Donald Trump. He controls 35% of America. He controls them. Uh, you know, I don't want to say they're lemmings, but I will say this. They'll jump off a cliff for him. They believe in him. Uh, they believe in him that strong. And so if, if President Trump came out like Ed Schaefer did, like, like John Hoven did, like Governor Burgum did, and said, you know what, I got vaccinated, you should too, then I really believe that we wouldn't be worrying one bit about whether or not this nation can achieve herd immunity. And you might say, well, look, you know, uh, what's the problem? A lot of people have been vaccinated. There's variants, ladies and gentlemen. There are. Th this thing is changing daily. And the science shows that the quicker we all get vaccinated, the less chance we have of this thing splitting off. It's serious. We're getting a chance every day to visit, and I've had five friends who died from COVID. They'd be here today if it wasn't for COVID. So my advice is please go get vaccinated. Good riding with you, folks.